Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. The information contained within this podcast does not consider your personal circumstances and is of a general nature only. You should not act on it without first obtaining professional financial advice specific to your circumstances. Paul Atherton is an ex-Wall Street advisor on a mission to help young people win back their financial power, wealth and security. He does this by helping them understand the hidden world of finance, risk and investments, helps them figure out how it impacts them and to seize the opportunities to make it work to their advantage. This is Paul Street Journal. I'm here with Paul Atherton. How are you, mate? Hey, Tim. How are you? Uh, Very good. It's a great morning. So... Last night, doing a little bit of my economics research, and came across the term liquidity crisis. Yeah, and I've heard this before, but and especially when you know the GFC was going on. What is a liquidity crisis? What does it mean? I, I just want to understand. Ah, oh, it's a brilliant question, Tim, and I'm I'm absolutely certain that the people that throw this around don't know what they're talking about. Uh, liquidity prices is often interchanged with just a fundamental issue versus a liquidity crisis. You know, I, I call, sometimes it's mixed up, is it a solvency problem? Like, is this company or is this sector going to survive? Or is it really just a short-term liquidity problem? I think probably the best thing to do is just define what liquidity means. So liquidity describes the ease and pace at which an asset or security can be bought or sold on a market. Well, generally, we talk about the stock market, but any market, the bond market for your, for, for your government debts and corporate debts. So the ease of which you can get in and out of the, um, your asset without affecting its price. That's liquidity. So let's say we go, and I'll use a very simple example. Let's say you go to your local market and you want to buy an apple or an orange and the day before they have had the biggest influx of apples and oranges and they're just inundated with it. Well, there are loads and, and say it's a grand final weekend, so there's no one turning up in the market. So what do you think the liquidity is? It's extremely high. Market's thin, you're e- easily able to go in because it's just you and maybe your mate um, and there's plenty of supply. So this is great. If you think about it, like heavily traded stocks such as BHP or any of the Australian banks which are heavily traded on the stock market, are kind of in the same position. There's loads of stock out there. There's plenty for sale and there's plenty for people to buy. So there's a lot of stock. And this is the case in a well-diversified market with many and varied market participants. In other words, any day I can go and buy, sell these shares. Okay, so what are examples of illiquid stocks? So an illiquid, so we just said liquidity means that there's a ease of which going in and it kind of makes sense so that's the liquid part you can go in get it out back and forth easy a liquid means it's not i don't know maybe we could call it molasses a great example might be penny stocks shares and hedge funds private companies and if there were a crisis well good luck getting out of these so as a rule stay away from these i mean there are obviously opportunities but uh, you're getting into the liquid areas Now, for the economy as a whole, a liquidity crisis means that the two main sources of liquidity, which is cash for banks and commercial paper market, so they're the main ones, cash and the commercial paper market, are severely reduced and they stop working. They stop making loans, the commercial paper markets, they call it, they call this freezing. And because so many companies rely on these loans, short-term loans, because they have to meet short-term obligations, think about it, any company has to do this. So they need cash, they need liquidity. And during a crisis, even normal liquid stocks or assets are no longer liquid. Remember, I think you've seen the odd bank run. Well, guess what? That is a liquidity crisis. Essentially, you need good buying and selling to keep things moving. So if like going to Woolies or Coles and there were really nothing there, perhaps it was there, but you weren't al- <laughs> they weren't selling. They say, yes, I could see you got lots of apples. I go, fine, but I'm not selling you any because we're, we're closed today. Or perhaps you weren't buying because you'd heard that everything was gone off. So that would also cause a crisis. And this is exactly what happened during the GFC. Because the banks didn't trust each other, creditworthiness, 
uh, would this bank be here tomorrow was a genuine question. We just stopped trading with each other, which of course made the entire situation 10 times worse. And there was a very well-known trade that happened the morning that Lehman collapsed. That very morning, a $270 million payment was made into the Lehman coffers in London, and it subsequently disappeared into vapor. Now, nobody wanted to make that mistake again, um, so we stopped trading. Right, so it just reiterates that point that the confidence in the market is such a big part of economics. It's... Confidence, yeah, but confidence needs to be reflected through liquidity. Mm. Like I said, it's a, a highly liquid market is a confident market, but it can turn, and it, you know, during the GFC, it turned instantaneously. So during during a crisis, I guess such as the the GFC, I uh, hear that short sellers make a lot of money. So what are what are short sellers? This is a term that I've heard. So. Yeah, well, that's a great great one. So someone that sells short take a while for people to get their head around this, and trust me, it, it's fine because it took me a while. Um, you sell a short, so what you do is you're betting on the decrease of a value of a stock. And in good economies with well-functioning markets, you're able legally to do that. Say you weren't keen on the Australian banks, and so what you would do and go, I'm sure they're going to go down. Well, you don't just have to sit on the sidelines. You can actively participate in it and make money off it. People do this. So what they do is they borrow the the stock from somebody that thinks they're going to go up or maybe a value investor that wants to hold for the long term. They go to the market, they borrow these shares and they sell them back into the market. Now, when these prices go down, they profit from the shortfall. So let's say for argument's sake, um, bank ABC was valued at 100 and that's what I did. I sold it short at 100 and let's say it went down to 50. I'd make $50 and I'd say essentially I would then buy back that company and close out my position. Uh, that's what sh- that's what short selling is. And again, they, they make market during a, they make a lot of money during a crisis. And during the GFC, they were hugely influential during this panic selling. So I think I understand. So they're basically selling uh, at a at a higher price and then replacing it at a lower price. So then yeah. they're essentially making the difference. Yeah. So th- it, like when you buy a stock, it's called going long. You want it to go up. So in this same example, it's Bank ABC. It goes from 100, goes to 150. I've just made $50. Oh, fantastic. Mm. Um, depending on how many shares you've got, hopefully more than one. Um, if it was one share, you'd make $50. If you make 10, 10 shares, you've made $500. Same goes if you sell short. If it goes down 50 from 100 to a 50, you've one share, you've made 50, you've made 10, you've made 500. So you bet on the price going down. To do this, again, you have to borrow the stock because mm. you don't have it. You're just selling it short. So you borrow it for a short term. It's very easy to do. It's not so perhaps it, it, for, to make it easier to understand for the listeners, it's let's say if we split it into 60-40. So you borrow the share valued at 100 um, sell it, sell it at a hundred, and then buy it back at sixty. Return it to the person correct. originally borrowed it for. You've made forty dollars. That's yeah. absolutely correct. Yeah, I heard some politicians called for the stopping of selling because some listeners may see that as like a corrupt, a corruption of the market, perhaps. Or yeah. So th- let's just first say that, in my opinion, sh- selling short selling is is. Uh, a valuable part of the uh, market. I mean, people should be able to have negative views of companies and it's a tension between people buying and selling. And don't underestimate it. Selling short is a bit of a risky proposition because in theory, we we'll go back to our example of uh, bank ABC, the most I can make from short selling if it goes to zero. So it goes from 100 to zero. The most That's literally the most I can make. The most I could lose is, in theory, infinity, because it can go to 200, go to 300, could keep going up and up, and I would be in a lot of trouble. And this is what happens. It's called a short squeeze. So I'm in a lot riskier position. So short sellers are not a big part of the market, but they are there, and they have their impact. And I think it's, it's important that they're there and that, that, that we let them play out their part. The thing is, is that every now and again, politicians try and intervene and they get a bit mixed up and so what often happens you think we'll stop people selling altogether because of all the crisis that happens and nobody wants to see their portfolio go down but it is asinine it 
doesn't take much of a thinking to really think actually it is asinine. Why is that? Because the only way to buy is for somebody to sell. You can't stop selling. If you stop selling, you stop buying. So it's like going to a store and saying, I really like this shirt or I really like this pair of jeans. I'm only allowed to buy. And then the person selling to you says, I'm sorry, I can't sell. The politicians have told me not to sell. So you won't literally not be able to buy the product. So a buyer can only be there if there's a seller. Which I know it sounds obvious, but people lose their way in this, particularly politicians. So selling is, and short selling, I think is a very important part of the market, but you can't stop selling. Because if you stop selling, you stop buying. Has anyone ever suggested kind of like in inflating the stock, inflating the amount of stock that there is? So let's say you've got 100 stocks and you can't sell any, so you can't buy any. But if you moved it up to, oh, we're going to divide it into 150 now, so you can sell 50 of them. Is that a way around? Sorry, are you saying do I um, move in and out of a stock or do I sell part of my stock? No, the whole no I'm saying it's a bit like inflation in a currency. They just mm. add more stocks into the system and it's still... Oh, okay. Yeah. So... The- Companies can intervene in the market and they buy back their stock. It drives up the stock price. I think I've mentioned this before, but Apple has 900 million shares. Lovely. So what they do is they go back into the market, buy it back, and it becomes a little bit more, let's say, a rarer commodity. Um, And that forces the shares up. It's a little bit more difficult to distribute more stock because once you're out, you're done. The way you get more stock is by a stock split. I'm not sure if you've heard this, but a stock split is when... Price gets high, let's say $200, and they'll say, we'll split it in half and make it $100. But now you have 100 shares at one stage at 200. You now all of a sudden have 200 shares at 100. Same dollar value. Nothing's changed. It's just more more stocks available. So uh, we get a better... uh, Again, this is probably liquidity, and more people are able to access the stock because there's more out there. Well, thank you for explaining that to me. I feel like I have a pretty good understanding of that now. That's great, Tim. Cheers. Paul Street Journal. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details.